Hello and welcome to this chemotherapy administration and handling talk. My name is Luke. I am the senior nursing manager at London Vet Specialists, part of the Linnaeus group. Um, and this talk will be quite safety driven. Um, it'll be a lot of health and safety type things. Some of the data is taken from human medicine, um, some of it from veterinary medicine. So uh, without further ado, let's get started. So a dress code, um, you should be wearing a full length gown with sleeves, it should be impermeable, i.e. it should have a slight plastic coating with elasticated cuffs. Um, the elasticated cuff ideally should be material so that if there are any spillages and you're not using gloves with a long enough cuff, that any spillages are absorbed. Your masks should be at least FFP3. Um, this is a safety standard. Goggles or a visor, glasses are not sufficient. If you wear glasses and you cannot see without them, just ideally put the goggles over the top or alternatively a, a, like a full face visor is also better. Um, we suggest nitrile gloves mostly because they're thicker. If you can't get these, you're not able to get these and that's fine, just double up or add two or three pairs of gloves, that's also sufficient. And ideally you should not be in your normal clothing. This probably applies to vets more than the nurses. Um, but just to make sure that you are in scrubs and that those scrubs are washed. If you are going to take them home, that's fine. My suggestion is don't go in with them on in case you've got any young children or you yourself aren't particularly well. My suggestion is just take them off at work um, and just wash them at home as you normally would, basically. OK, we will move on. So this is kind of the guidelines for the room that you're administering chemotherapy in. It should be free from food and drinks. You should not be chewing gum while the administration is happening. No application of makeup. Now, what you don't want to happen is you don't want to give a barrier like a seal. Um, if you are going to apply makeup, you should do it outside of the room, not inside of the room. And like I said, the reason for this is made to, to make sure that you've not, um, you're not containing the chemotherapy residue onto your face, essentially. The room should be low traffic. You should not need to access this room to pass through the building or to retrieve equipment. Now, one way to avoid that is just to fit a lock on the door. It's nice and easy. It's safer. Um, I always place a sign on the door just to make people aware what is happening, especially if you do have people that are pregnant within the building. It just reminds them, you know, just to be extra safe. Um, and ideally, this should be a room specific to chemotherapy. Now, I understand that isn't ideal. So just have a room that's probably one that isn't you excuse me, isn't used as much as, as the others. So just take that into, into account when, when choosing what room to administer into. So just a continuation from the last slide. Um, so the following things that we have on site is a cytotoxic spill kit with duplicate PPE, so gown, gloves, mask and goggles in that kit. If you don't want to buy proper kits, then what you can do is you can just do this with cat litter in a Tupperware box, but also to make sure that you've still got the PPE available. We also advise some extravasation equipment for irritants and vesicants. Ideally, you need access for running water. This is for washing hands after admin. But also, if you can't get an eye wash kit or you don't happen to have it to hand and you do spill something in your eye because you're not wearing your goggles, then it's just good just to splash water straight into that um, just to avoid any problems in the long run. You should have a purple topped sharp spin, which can be purchased from plenty of companies you can find them quite easily. And we always keep copies of our SOPs and relevant documents in the room with us in a folder just to be sure that if there are any issues, it's just easy and we haven't got to pass through the room in our personal protective equipment to get anywhere we need. Now, pre chemotherapy checks. Now, this is mostly done by the oncologist. So the way that our clinic works is that the client comes into reception and is greeting, greeted by our reception team. The client is then taken into the consultation room with their pet. I will then retrieve the patient, weigh them and take them down into the hospital for a blood test, a pre-chemotherapy -hem pre haematology test. Um, but it's also just important to make sure that you have some sort of checklist in place. And the reason we do this is just to make sure that we definitely are, we're just being safe, we're safeguarding ourselves more than anything. So on there is the patient name, surname, the weight, um, we calculate body surface area, have the bloods been checked, what drug is necessary, the drug dosage, um, the milliliters, so the volume of drug that needs to be administered, 
and it's just kind of like a tick sheet basically the one thing that we do make sure that we do is that the oncologist and myself will both initial to say that we've seen the bloods and that we've checked the doses and that we both agree that the body surface area is the same and the dose works out to be the same and again this is this is just it's just pure safeguarding especially with things like chemotherapy whereas if you give too much you know you could potentially jeopardize the animal's health a lot more um, so this is just making sure you're, you're safe better than sorry essentially so here is just an example of a chemotherapy checklist so as you can see it's pretty easy um, patient ID is at the top you can either put a sticker on that or just type right in the patient name which is what we do the body weight the body surface area what drug is being administered and the PPE worn and disposed of correctly that's more there as a prompt now I'm pretty sure that most people will just look at that and initiate it anyway, but it's just there to be a reminder to make sure that you are dressing appropriately when when using these medications. Um, we've also got the bloods on there. Now, the most important things are the neutrophil count, the hematocrit and the platelet count. Now, we're just checking that those again, we're just reassuring ourselves that if the value is on there, we can then check it. We haven't got to keep referring back to the bloods here and there. Just saved ourselves a bit of time, really. And the reason we have on there which vein it's been administered through is because we quite like to alternate um, venipuncture sites each week. Um, the long term chemotherapy patients will build up a lot of scar tissue within their legs. And so it's just nicer for them also um, as much as possible just to alternate where we're um, stabbing them, I should say. So this is just the general safety point when you're storing the drugs um, and, and, and use essentially. Chemotherapy drugs should be stored in their own lockable fridge. If this isn't possible, then that's fine, but it's best to have them again in some sort of Tupperware pot, ideally in two or three. Again, it's just pure safety, just to make sure that someone can't go in and just, you know, just grab a vial of vincristine, um, accidentally thinking it's, I don't know, insulin, for example. Um, sometimes, you know, that can happen where the reception team have made their way into the hospital, which is totally fine, um, thinking that they're getting insulin for someone when actually they've just, you know, they've touched the vial of of chemotherapy which will have residue on the box um, so that's quite important to make sure that we're safeguarding our members of staff as well um, ideally you should be wearing gloves whenever you're touching the fridge or whenever wherever these chemotherapy vials are again it's just safe um, we always ensure that the drugs are not placed directly onto a surface it's fine if you are you just need to make sure that, that surface is cleaned appropriately which we will go over later in the uh, presentation but please just make sure that the drug is on an inco sheet or a kidney just, just to be safe. And if there are any spillages, deal with them immediately. Please do not leave them just to soak into the surface that they're on. It's best to get that sorted as soon as possible. So here we have our chemotherapy administration safety devices. Now there are a few and this isn't a sales pitch, so I will include several. The one we use is Facil. Um, there are some more coming onto the market, which we are investigating into. Um, it really comes down to personal preference, really. Facil is kind of the one that's been there for the longest, which I think most people are using, and they're, and they're a good system. So um, really, it comes with a variety of different attachments. You've got some attachments that go into the vials, which are the P21s and P14s. Those will do your, your vincristines and your vinblastin vials, um, and also your cyclophosphamide vials if you're using injectable, not oral. Um, so obviously then you have your special syringes as well, which are Lurlock and they make what, what they are, are they are a securable syringe. So you twist them on to make sure that they're in place. They're not just a simple, um, they're not a lure slip. So they actually have to twist in place to, to make sure they're connected. Um, you should not be using a normal needle and syringe to draw chemotherapy from a syringe with a syringe from the vial. And this just minimizes your exposure to aerosols or chemotherapy drawing. Um, at the dose when you're drawing the dose it, it minimizes your exposure to that residue and this is again this is just safety just making sure that you feel safe when doing so and other members of staff are safe as well so just a couple of other devices that you can use we have a teva teva adapter which is brawn and you also have a kimono which is viagon and the lurlock syringes are compatible with both so it's in a way it's financial financially beneficial you don't need to buy loads of different syringes and loads of different things like this. You can just buy the different sets and the syringes are compatible with all. So it's pretty handy in that sense. They were made to be this way. Okay, so pre-administration. 
Um, you need a patent fresh cannula. If we have patients that are hospitalized for investigations and then they need chemotherapy, I will still endeavor to, to place a new cannula. Whether that one is patent still, I would always just place a new one. If I'm the one administering the chemotherapy, I feel safer having placed that IV. Um, again, this is more, this is a personal choice, but you guys should take that into account when administering chemotherapy. We use a clear white tape, and this is to ensure that we can see any leaks, preferably a two port extension line. And this is to allow an ease of flushing, which again will be explained in a later slide. Um, you will need an assistant. Please don't give chemotherapy on your own and have everything you need ready and close by. Okay, so here we are at our point of administration. We have our chemotherapy in the house syringe drawn and ready to administer. Now the syringe safety device, which is the blue bit you can see, that's not active yet. So if we were to push the syringe, you wouldn't be able to, there'd be a huge amount of resistance. So that chemotherapy isn't going to go anywhere, not just yet anyway. So here we are at our point number two. Now the N35, which is the syringe safety device, that's now active and is ready for administration. Um, I'm just going to quickly pop back so you guys can see. So the N35 is the one in the middle there, second in from the left, and that's what's called our syringe safety device. Our C35, just the one on the left there, that's our catheter connector, essentially. So that allows your N35 to go straight into the line, essentially. Here we have point number three. So our chemotherapy has been administered and the flush has been connected to the line. Now, what we do is we connect the flush at the bottom, and this is why it's important to have a two port extension. You've got the chemotherapy at the top and you've got the flush connected to the needle free bung at the bottom there. Um, and then what we do is we occlude the line to fill the chemotherapy syringe. And this just makes sure that there's no residue left in the line, essentially. OK. So here we have a video for you and I will just leave this to play and I will talk through it as we go. So this patient was aggressive and was sedated with an intramuscular injection um, and was receiving oxygen at the time. So we've placed a patent cannula. Here I have my glamorous assistant, one of my nurses helping me. Um, and this cat will be receiving 0 0.7 milligrams per meter squared of vincristine as part of a CHOP protocol for lymphoma. So here we have our syringe safety device going into our connector. If you just push that in, it pushes a vial for a membrane. We undo the port and we are ready to go. And it's really quick. You know, most of these drugs can be a bolus, except for your doxorubicins. These need to be over about sort of 20 to 30 minutes. Um, and this is what I mentioned by including the line. As you can see, as the flush goes in, the chemotherapy syringe fills. And it's just a case of just doing that. You can do that two or three times. If your patient's wiggling around, then if you can, do it once. If you can't, don't do it at all. It's better not to risk um, the patient losing the line and you know chemotherapy residue all over the room that you've been that you've been working in. And here I am struggling to find the end of my tape, unfortunately, um, just trying to remove the IV. Now we make sure that we leave everything connected to ensure that we aren't risking it. Like I said, we're not risking any residue um, or any aerosols getting into the air. So it's just safe to leave everything connected as much as you can. Um, one of the, the biggest route of exposures actually is aerosol. And again, this is just, this is another reason to ensure that we are using the safety devices provided by the companies like Facil, Braun and Bygon. And um, most of these are airtight. And this is, again, just ensuring that there's no risk of aerosol or any residue in the environment, not only for yourself and the person helping you, but also for people that are then potentially entering and exiting, exiting the room, you know, at a later time during that day. So here we are again, we just leave making sure everything is still connected and the IV comes out and goes straight into the bin, which is important to remember. It's just good to have everything um, safe by. Everything is close. Everything is safe. It's just one big swoop. Everything's gone. Um, and then the pressure bandage goes on. 
And as, as you can see, unfortunately, we did have another try in the opposite for him, uh, but the cannula wouldn't advance, so we chose to stop. And we and we we used another leg. You know, it's it's just not safe to be given chemotherapy in a vein that you're not so sure of. So we will move on. So this is after chemotherapy. You should chew. You should be washing your hands straight after with any sort of medicinal soap of choice, whether that be chlorhexidine, bactilin, you know, all these types of things are acceptable. Ideally, these patients should be housed separately in an isolation ward. If this isn't possible, then a barrier nurse sign must be placed on the front of the kennel. Bedding should be put on a hot wash, if not like as hot as possible, with some sort of disinfectant. Um, and when you're cleaning the kennel, it's the same principle when you're giving chemotherapy, gowns with sleeves, thick gloves, and goggles, mask, all these things should be used. Um, and ideally when you are cleaning the kennels and tables and all these types of things, you should be using bleach. Um, most bleach dilutes to one in 10, just check the packaging to see what it says, but bleach does degrade most forms of chemotherapy and this is the preferred cleaner. Now, what you should do is you ideally shouldn't use some sort of spray bottle. Instead, you should pour the bleach once diluted onto the area that you're trying to clean. And the reason for this is so that you don't get a splash. And then again, you're causing some sort of mist and an aerosol into the into the um, the room that you're in. So again, it's better safe than sorry. Let's just be careful with these things. So here we have some chemotherapy residues. Now residue will be everywhere. So it says here, so it's urine, saliva, feces, vomit, sweat, tears, hair and earwax. Um, now our advice to our clients is that they maintain normal hygiene at home. Canine owners are encouraged to carry water to wash away urine or feces when on walks. Now, yes, okay, technically the water doesn't degrade the chemotherapy, but we, we don't necessarily want people out carrying bleach, you know, especially with things like wildlife and over parks and things like that. So this is what we recommend. Um, now, in veterinary patients, this is quite hard. Uh, it's quite difficult data to find. I can't find a maximum period, so the minimums are what we're going to have to go by. Um, but these are the minimum periods at which residues remain in the body. And these are kind of six of the most common um, chemotherapies that we administer, which is why I've included them on here. So your carboplatin is five days, your chlorambucil is two days, doxorubicin is seven, lamostine is three, vincristine and vinblastine are three days as well. Now, this is these are things to consider for, for you guys as the chemotherapy um, agents but also for this is advice for clients as well so if you know if you've got people that are a bit skeptical about chemo and you feel that this is the best thing for your patient then these are definitely some some numbers that you can potentially give to your clients just to support them in making their decision so generally chemotherapy is well tolerated that's in 15 15 to 20 percent of patients um, now some of these 15 to 20 percent do have side effects however most of these are pretty mild and pretty brief and they can be managed at home with, you know, things like meropotent, procolin, metazapine. You know, these things are easily managed at home, um, especially with your aggressive patients. If you don't want to have them in because it is stressful for them, then we can definitely manage these things at home. Um, about 5% of patients have greater needs, i.e. they need hospitalisation for drips or other intense therapy for several days. Um, you know, some of these patients can have really severe diarrhoea and they need rectal foleys and things like that. but Generally, they do pick up sort of, sort of two to three days of supportive treatment and fluids, and they do start to pick up. Um, and far fewer than 1% of patients are lost to the side effects of chemotherapy. They're more likely to be um, to be lost as an effect of the tumour. Um, but this really is quite rare, to be honest. It doesn't happen very often at all. So an extravasation. Um, one of the biggest agents to be concerned about is um, doxorubicin or epirubicin. Um, now, if you are administering doxorubicin, it's best to have the desidroxane on site. Now, this is the antidote that is offered. Um, it can be quite costly, but it is safer to have because it's a choice between if a patient has an extravasation, it will very likely need an amputation or you just have the antidote on site to potentially avoid that happening. It's, again, it's better safe than sorry. Um, if you do have an extravasation, then you need to withdraw and remove as much of the drug as possible if the if the cannula is subcutaneous do not place a new one just withdraw as much as you can possibly get out of that site 
Um, mark the area of a permanent marker to monitor for superficial ulceration. This is just good for monitoring. The antidote comes in a form of a 500 milligram powder for constitution. The reconstitution guidelines are there for you. Um, dogs have IV administration over 15 minutes and cats is just an IV bolus. This should be administered within six hours of the extirpation occurring and I, it should be within four hours of the reconstitution. Um, I de now there are some studies that said that a cold compress was best. However, those have been, it, the, the literature has been changed and now they are suggesting that a wool compress is better every four to eight hours for several days. And you can add some sort of steroid based ointment like um, Fusiderm or something like this. Um, it can take days or weeks to reach severity. Um, our advice, if this does happen, is probably to take a picture every couple of every other day or so, or every day, and just keep them documented, just to just to keep an eye on them and monitor them. Um, and as mentioned, unfortunately, if there are if there are severe cases, surgical debridement and most likely amputation is probably necessary. Um, and here you have just on the right here. Um, we have some images, so A, B and C. So I think A is an initial extravasation. Uh, B is probably about sort of five to seven days and C will be about 10 days later. Um, so it just really goes to show you the severity of the, um, the ulceration um, and realistically kind of like a rotting type thing that's going on there. Um, it's not looking very nice. So here, this is extrapolated from some human data. And this just goes to show you um, kind of it seems silly, but just goes, it's just acts as a reminder, you know, if you're unpacking a, a delivery of chemotherapy, for example, there is a residue on that box. And there, you know, again, this is human data and they're getting these huge packages with, with a large quantity of drug, but they're saying, you know, two pairs of gloves is, is, is the advice, then, then that's what it is, you know. Um, sterile preparations, if you're making things up, creams, ointments, oil solutions, now, it does say crushing tablets, which we are very against. You should not be crushing chemotherapy tablets. Um, I can't comment on if they are doing that in human medicine, but we advise against that. Again, this is for safety. So I'll just give you a couple more seconds to read through this, just to grab some pictures if you feel necessary. OK, moving on. So human data. Now, the most common routes of exposure are skin or mucous membrane contact, inhalation of aerosols, vapors and dusts, dusts as in powders from within the vial, um, ingestion, so eating or drinking administration areas, subsequent to poor hygiene um, and sharps, which we all know, you know, we can accidentally, um, you know, stab ourselves with a needle occasionally. Um, and this is actually quite common in human medicine, believe it or not. Um, so acute effects can last for a week or months. Um, now, you don't always get everything. Now, the effects can differ between people, but mostly it's some sort of dizziness, nausea, headache, a dermatitis and any sort of menstrual problems. Um, now, as I said, the number of above symptoms present is associated with the number of doses handled and the extent of protection, i.e. if we're doing this 10 times a day and we're not wearing gloves, then you're more likely to experience these effects. Um, and actually, it, it's difficult to say, but acute events are underreported. Um, now, our chronic effects, we have things like a cancer, although this is very difficult to quantify because, you know, if, for example, we have a human nurse that has been diagnosed with cancer, th there's actually no way to, to trace back and say, well, actually, it was due to the fact that you spent one year in a chemotherapy clinic. That's really hard to quantify. It's just a it's a suspicion that they have in the human data. Um, and then we have our reproductive effect. So we have an increase in fetal loss. There is a possibility of congenital malformations, low birth weight, congenital abnormalities, infertility, and actually learning difficulties in children of nurses who have handled these cytotoxic drugs has been documented and is being documented um, as well. So that's quite interesting. Um, so this is from the International Society of Oncology Pharmacy Practitioners and and basically what this is, is it's kind of like a, it's like a scoring system, essentially. Um, so if you can't reach level one, then we move to level two, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm just going to leave this up for you guys to have a quick look at that. All 
and then we are that's it um if you have any questions please feel free to email us or email myself um i think the big take homes from this is chemotherapy is a dangerous agent not necessarily just for just for our patient it's also it can be quite dangerous and quite daunting i would imagine for a lot of people that are administering these drugs as well so it's very important to to be considerate of that you know for it, for both vets and nurses um it's super important to make sure that we're not that everyone is on the same page and that people are being provided with the equipment that is recommended and that is necessary um and if you don't have that equipment then it's okay to say no um to make sure that you are safe when being involved in these practices is quite important okay thank you very much for listening and as i said any questions please feel free to email me